Hello and welcome to Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. We are your hosts, Vidas Pinkavichus. And Ushamut Zide Pinkavichin. We've been mastering secrets of organ playing for more than 20 years and sharing them on this blog since 2011. On this show, which we create from our home in Vilnius, Lithuania, we strive to help you grow in every area of organ playing, including practice, technique, repertoire, sight reading, hymn playing, improvisation, composition, music theory, harmony, and many others. Our hope is to help you become a complete musician, or what we call as total organist, a program which we have created to help you reach your dreams faster than you would do on your own. If you are new here, we invite you to subscribe to receive free updates of this blog at organduo.lt. By subscribing, you will also receive free video on how to master any organ composition and 10-day organ playing mini chords. And now let's go to the podcast for today. So I'm here with Carson Kuman, who is a wonderful American composer. He has been on our podcast uh, some months ago, uh, and uh, he, he has an extensive catalog with hundreds of works in many forms, from solo instrumental pieces to operas and from orchestral works to hymn tunes. And um, uh, his music has been performed on all six inhabited continents in venues that range from the stage of Carnegie Hall to the basket of a hot air balloon. That's amazing. (laughs) So uh, uh, before we start this conversation, I just want to uh, tell you guys uh, that uh, I looked at the... um, at the list of Carson's compositions. And uh, it's amazingly very extensive list. Uh, His last opus is 1,344 opus, Scherzetto, created this year. And the first opus uh, was created in 1992. So I guys uh, calculated it's like uh, uh, 27 years ago that uh, he started publishing uh, his works and uh, to this day produced uh, on average on average about one piece a week is that uh, accurate uh, carson and by the way thank you so much for joining this and welcome to the show oh thank you thank you for having me uh it's New, I, the math is accurate, I suppose. It, it averages out to, I guess, a piece a week. It, in in reality, that's not what necessarily what happens. Some pieces take a week. Some pieces take much, much longer than a week. But mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, something like like a um, a hymn tune, for example, is is a, takes a very short amount of time. You know, that's the sort of thing you could easily do in a day. Whereas something like a, a an evening long oratorio, which is one of my recent works, that that took that took about ten months to write. So, is it accurate to say, Carson, that uh, you have uh, composed more pieces than Johann Sebastian Bach? Uh, I mean, preserved pieces that, than Bach. I don't. I, I don't know what the official number is for Bach. I, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure what the. And it depends on how you count them as well. But yes. um Right, and of course, there's a lot of things that are that are lost. But um, yes, it, it was it was much more common in the pre-Romantic eras, in the classical period, in the Baroque period, and earlier. It was much more common to be extremely prolific. Mm-hmm. It's much it's a much more recent Romantic and post-Romantic idea that we have here that composers write only small numbers of pieces. So um, so I. There was a time when it wasn't that strange at all to be very prolific. You know, you, I mean, Bach, as you say, did write a lot of pieces, but so did almost every other composer that was working at the same time Bach did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, the famous people like Handel and things, but also also people whose names we don't even remember today. Um, so the idea of being very prolific um, used to be fairly normal mm-hmm, by mm-hmm. comparison. 
your, it's it's so amazing to think that you are creating on average one piece per week, right? We struggle as to 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 create something uh, in 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 month or, or or more, right? But you are doing like a machine, like a like a like a, on a um, conveyor belt uh, sort of, <laughs> right? Well, I, I mean, everyone has different ways of working. I mean, I, I I've come to sort of realize that over time that you know. People have different speeds at which they create they mm -hmm. create things. It doesn't necessarily mean anything about the the resulting product. I know you know there are there are wonderful composers who have written very prolifically, and there are terrible composers who have written very few pieces. So you know it and and every everything in between. So there's there's not necessarily a correlation mm -hmm. between how and um, composers often see that as well. You know you, I I have so many colleagues who, who talk about you know they they have a piece that they labored over for months and months and months you know put spent so long on it and it gets performed and then it just disappears it you know it has no has no future life and then some piece that they wrote very quickly in a couple days becomes the most popular thing they've ever done so you, you know it's it's very it's very unpredictable like a lot of things about about um about creative process certainly and and um i think you anyone who's creating work has to figure out the way and speed that they do that. And speed is only one part of it. There's, you know, there's all sorts of other aspects that go into how one finds a creative process or develops that. And sort of figuring out what the way is to be authentic to the way that you, that, you know, any one person creates mm -hmm. is ultimately, ultimately what matters. And so for some of us that, that involves producing a lot of music and for some people it involves producing very little music. Um, I, to me, that's not necessarily a judgment issue one way or another, as long as people are being authentic to the, the way that they, you know, the, the way that they create. And, um, I think, I think necessarily forcing yourself to, to work in a different way is not always productive. It can sometimes be interesting to try something a bit differently, but, um, at some point you, you, you know what you, you know what and how you go about doing what you do you know and that's mm -hmm. not just true for creating stuff that's true of playing or practicing or whatever and and you um you sort of build up this body of knowledge of how how to do something a particular way yes uh, carson i can relate to this idea of amazing uh, productivity because my dad uh, was a painter and he used to to paint every day you know and mm -hmm. um, and very quickly and mm -hmm. left uh, really thousands of of, of paintings uh, smaller perhaps and larger pieces to and and then drawings as well you know thousands tens of thousands of drawings mm -hmm. probably filed mm -hmm. in his in his um, uh, archive you know and um, i've been i've been uh, wanting to chat with him about that, how he can come up with so many creative ideas, but I can no longer do that because mm. he is no longer with us. So, mm -hmm. but uh, but you are here, Carson. <laughs> so it's amazing to meet uh, such a prolific uh, creator like yourself, and ask ask those questions that probably are on many. Uh, creators minds uh, your you your a lot of pieces composed are for organ right you primarily are uh, probably consider yourself as an organist or started as an organist now obviously created everything uh, that can be mm -hmm. created including uh, opera and symphonies right mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, but of course for our audience uh, uh, this organ related uh, compositional process is very interesting probably so um, uh, do you remember the first piece that you wrote this this in 1992 uh, which which you list uh, opus 1 um, what inspired you to start creating back then um i, I, I you're right that i am as a performer i am an organist basically exclusively at this point. Uh, back when I started composing, I was studying the piano um, and had been for a number of years. I had yet to, I was still a few years away from, from switching to playing the organ. Um, and also in those years, I also studied the cello for a few years. 
And mm -hmm. so my first piece was actually a piece for cello. I, I, I was not a serious or particularly talented cellist. Um, so that was, that was just a few years of study many years ago. Nice. Um, but it happened to coincide with the time that I started uh, notating music uh, composition. So my, my first piece actually was a piece for cello. And then I think most of my other very earliest pieces were for piano. Um, I think a couple other very early ones were for violin and piano. I had a, I had a friend I grew up with um, and she played the violin. Um, and I know I, I wrote a few very early pieces for the two of us to play together. And then I also wrote some organ music, even, even before I, I started studying the organ myself, because I was, I was interested in the organ. And so I, my first organ compositions are before I even started playing or taking organ lessons. Um, that's, of course, not, in one sense, that's not unusual. Composers um, write from, you know, I've written for endless numbers of instruments that I've never played and never will play. That's part of what learning to compose is for. Um, but, uh, but yes, and certainly before I had written down notated compositions, I, I, um, I certainly so I developed compositions, particularly at the piano, that I that I didn't write down. Uh, some of them probably began sort of as improvisations, but um, but they they came to a fairly fixed form in that they weren't written out. But I would play them the same way every time. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so there were some period of years of doing that even before I wrote down a piece on paper. Um, and sort of began my numbered list of works, um, yes. which I started giving opus numbers pretty early, just for the sake of, um, I've always been very, fairly organized when it comes to cataloging and lists and things. So the reason for doing that was simply so that I wouldn't ever lose track of anything. I'd just give every piece, each new piece just gets a number, no matter how big or small it is. Um, if I were doing it over again, maybe I wouldn't call them opus numbers because some, for some people they have this idea that the opus number means something big. And it, to me, it's just, it's just a piece. It's just literally what the word means. So uh, a very small piece gets one number and a piece that's a, over an hour long for orchestra also gets one number. Um, yes. it's, just a cat, it's just a catalog system mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, that's right. The first piece that you list is Opus 8, Petit Carillon uh, from 1992 for organ, right? Yes. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. a, a few pieces are not listed on the, on yeah, the catalog. Yeah, cer certainly th there's, an, there's a number in among the first probably several hundred opus numbers. There's a number mm -hmm. of pieces that I no longer make available in the way that most composers, you know, you have a certain amount of juvenilia that one doesn't... Um, uh, Petite Carillon is very early, and I only made that available a few years ago. Again, at the uh, urging of a of a, a colleague of mine, and I, I pulled it out because it's it's a it's a very early piece. It's my first organ piece, but um, for a concert project, he wanted to he wa he wanted something that was very much at the beginning of what I was doing, and then played it along with some more recent pieces. So I, I was I was willing to do it uh, for that case. But there are a lot of other many other early pieces that I that I don't make available. And it's not like there aren't a lot, I mean, I have a lot of pieces. So it's, so it's not like I need to keep around some things that were written from the years when I was, you know, still trying to learn what I was doing. Yes. So, so Carson, uh, from 1992, you have just one work listed, right? This Petit Carillon. And then yeah, 1993, yeah. Obsession, Opus 14, right? Mm -hmm for the piano mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. uh, opus 19 for from 1995 suite for strings a couple of pieces from 95 uh, suite for children also uh, opus 20 you know and then mm -hmm. uh, a few years later you start uh, like a very serious and uh, prolific work right starting from mm -hmm. i believe 1998 you have mm -hmm. lots and lots of opuses that year yes mm -hmm. yeah. what happened that year um, I think it's it's not even so much that there are more pieces from there. It's just I started keeping more of them in uh -huh. the list, you know. Um, and and also by that point, <clears throat> about ninety eight, ninety nine was also when it became very clear to me that being a composer was going to be the main thing I was going to do. Um, uh, yes. I think in the in the years before that, like like anyone does in that that age, you know, you're still thinking about what what are the possibilities for what field or interest? And I, I was very interested in music, 
but I, you know, I, my life could have gone in other directions too. Um, mm -hmm. But by, by the late, by the late nineties, it was very clear to me that I was going to be primarily a composer, whatever else I did, composing was going to be the core of my identity. So I think that's probably another reason why there, there start to be even more pieces from then. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, can you identify a few of the, um, periods of your creative periods uh, because probably you have <laughs> had some breakthroughs right revelations uh, and changed some stylistic elements in your process too um yeah probably to some degree i i've always been fairly wide ranging in what has interested me so i think mm -hmm. my my pieces have my pieces have and continued to to go in different expressive directions depending on what the what um, is at hand. So some pieces are more, you know, are more tonal or modal than others necessarily. It, it's it's probably less about sort of periods of time was doing one thing as it is sort of different pieces do different things. And for me, different genres are happiest when they do certain things. Um, I writing atonal music for choirs, for example. I find very um, unsatisfying. Uh, choirs don't want to sing it. Audiences don't want to hear it. No one wants to spend the time rehearsing it. My colleagues who sort of force themselves to do that just seem upset all the time. So I, I don't see the point. I don't see the point in trying to force a genre into doing something that it doesn't seem to want to do. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I have musical ideas and thoughts that go in less tonal directions. Mm -hmm. So those ideas and thoughts can be used in other genres, in other instrumental genres and things where that kind of music is, is more natural to play and it doesn't involve people in a group trying to find pitches out of the air in their voice. And, and, um, and so, so because of that, because I've always been interested in working in many genres, I've never been, never ever had an interest in just doing one particular thing. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I, I have written a lot of organ music, for example, but I've written just as much other kinds of music. Um, and I've never wanted to to become one of those composers that only writes choral choral music or only writes music for band or only writes that has never interested me. I've always wanted to write the widest range of uh, of genres and scorings possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then what that allows me to do is to think about what the different expressive dimensions that are possible in different genres and not feel like i'm I'm sort of forcing something to do what it doesn't want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's both the it's both the scoring and the genre, and it's also the context, you know, the kind of piece that I might write if a church commissioned me to write something for their anniversary is not necessarily the same kind of piece I would write if a university contemporary music ensemble commissions a piece. Yes. Um, you know, if I, if I gave the church a piece that was like what I gave the university new music ensemble, they might be very unhappy. Yes. And I don't, I don't really see, the, I don't see the point of, of, working against the grain in, mm -hmm. in certain things like that. I feel one of the advantages of being able to work in many genres is, uh, is being able to let ideas sort of happen in a place that is, that is natural for them. Uh -huh. I remember a few weeks ago when we first uh, contacted about our conversation, I wanted to play some of your organ duets, right? With Osha and you graciously uh, provided uh, a few of them uh, uh, for us and we cite them mm -hmm. especially I liked those funny uh, sounds that you created for Halloween I think um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I forgot the name but you probably remember yeah yeah Tarantella Demente yeah mm -hmm. yes Demente exactly uh, it's 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 uh, created for for some kind of uh, AGO chapter right uh, concert I believe it was. Yeah, that was from a, quite a while ago. Yeah, it was for a Halloween, a Halloween concert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, which is something that's fairly common, at least in the at least in the USA, having organ concerts in Halloween. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, so yeah, we started playing, and uh, some of this music is really um, fun to play, while other music is uh, more serious. You know, more contemporary sounding, uh, mm -hmm. less 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 uh, sh um, uh, less understandable perhaps for the average music listener right mm -hmm, and uh, mm -hmm. you have to be a little bit more knowledgeable uh, for certain kind of your pieces but for other pieces like this tarantella is really really fun for anybody right mm -hmm, um, yep. so it probably means that you are very versatile um, versatile composer and uh, 
and you have a lot of ideas, right? Do you, Carson, recycle your ideas throughout genres and uh, uh, mediums, uh, various instruments? Do you do that? Sometimes, sometimes. It, it depends. Um, um, I remember, I remember, um, I remember in an interview, uh, Philip Glass once talking about um, the, uh, the idea of a composer reusing an idea in one piece of the next. And he said, you know, sometimes composers, critis you know, composers are criticized when they do that. And the person says, well, why don't you, you know, wh why are you using that idea again? Why don't you think up a new idea? And he said, you know, the reason composers throughout history, which is, which is totally true, the reason composers throughout history have sometimes used an idea in more than one piece is not because they can't think up a new idea. It's because they like that idea a lot and they, they want it to have another chance to be heard again. And maybe that idea first appeared in a piece that, that won't be played very much. So why, why shouldn't it appear in another piece, you know? And, and I, I, have, I have in a somewhat similar way uh, from time to time done that. I've, I've, um, I've taken something that was in a piece that maybe hasn't seen a lot of performances and I've used it in, I've decided, oh, there's another context I can use that in a piece later. And occasionally I've also built, I've also been able, I've combined some shorter pieces that were written over time and to make a, to make a, a bigger piece or combine, not just sort of stuck them together, but sort of rework, rework them together. So I certainly have done that. I would not say it's, I don't know what percentage of my output is things like that. It's pretty small percentage. Um, most things are, most things are not repeated. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I don't consider that a judgment thing one way or another. Um, it's just, um, sometimes, and all, the other reason I think sometimes for using an earlier idea in another piece is, is you know you, you want something like what you did before and you could come up with something new that's just a lesser version of what you already did. Or you could use that earlier one that's the best version of what it is in a different context. So, uh -huh. so I, think, I think that's sometimes the reason as well. And then sometimes pieces, you, sometimes you might just, you might, someone might have a context where a piece that has one scoring gets changed to another, you know, one of the instruments changes or something because of a, a request or a need for a performer. And they might say, you know, I really like this but it would be so nice if the oboe part were a saxophone part and then we could play it on this concert. And so if, if a change like that makes sense, musically, composers do, you know, do things like that, certainly. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, I really um, think that composers uh, shouldn't limit themselves. Uh, if they have uh, a beautiful idea which would work for another genre or, or another piece, it's, it's okay to borrow, right? Yeah. Or to steal. You can steal yeah. from many things, not only from other composers. You can steal Yeah, from oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, at the end of the day, each piece on its own has to sort of succeed or fail on its own terms. Um, there is some sense, sure, of the piece in the larger context of your catalog of a, as a composer, what other pieces you've written. But ultimately, any given piece, any one piece has to sink or swim on its own, it has to be its own, its own thing. And so, um, so I think in that context, you want to do the best job you can for any one thing. And if that, if that part of doing that means using material from earlier, using something else, there, there's no reason not to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. So then my next question, Carson, is very, very logical. <laughs> How do you come up with so many different ideas, you know, for, for different pieces. It's, um, it's, it's one thing to, to create 100 pieces or one, maybe a few hundred of pieces, but it's still a lot. But when you do this um, over and over, uh, a week, once a week or sometimes uh, a few times per week uh, for a new piece, right, on average, um, is there a process for you to come up with new ideas? I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say specifically for that there's a process. I mean, I have a sort of larger process of how I tend to write music. I guess coming up with different ideas has never been particularly difficult for me. That's probably one of the reasons why I started composing in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, that, that part was never especially tricky. Um, what what I tend to do is I tend to I tend to know what things I need to write for a period of 
often usually a few years ahead of time. I have some sense of the things I need to do. And so I spend, the, there's a lot of mental time for me spent sort of in my head thinking towards what those pieces are going to be and what their what their concepts are going to be and and over the course of that process which can sometimes unfold over many months sometimes while I'm doing other things or working on other pieces at some point part of the brain is is working on those other pieces mm -hmm. and so when the time comes to actually write the piece out that happens usually relatively quickly if the if the sort of preparation work has been done and so, um, so the, the actual generation of the ideas is admittedly never something that's been particularly hard for me. Um, um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't really have an ex I don't really have a particular explanation that way or another. I think coming up with ideas or not is one of the reasons why some people become composers or some people don't. You know, in the mm -hmm. in in. Um, in the same way, I don't. I have no ideas for making paintings, for example, and I have no technical skill painting. So, I, you know, it wouldn't cross my mind to think of doing that. But maybe if I had, you know, if I at at age eight had suddenly started having a lot of ideas for making paintings, maybe I maybe I would have tried to learn and develop how to become a painter rather than a composer. So. Um, you know, I think some of some of that is just sort of what happens when you're a certain age and how you how you develop. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, th there is a saying that if Bach lived among us, uh, maybe like today, right? Uh, he really would have created a different kind of art, uh, not necessarily organ music, not necessarily music at all, perhaps because it he would have been influenced by many different things of today's world right yeah it's hard it's hard to know it's hard to know i mean um yeah i think all composers in all era in all eras are you know you're, we're how we, we can't be anything other than a product of the times mm -hmm. that we're in so uh so the idea of you know bach existing now is hard it's hard to say because he was so much a product of that very germanic lutheran world that he was part of at that time you know mm -hmm. that just sort of and it, and it's not like bach wrote in every musical genre that was available to him in his era he clearly had no interest in writing opera and theater music for example um whereas many of his colleagues did um and that that was absolutely no part of his world at all um whether by choice or by circumstance mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. So I think any of us find ourselves in certain certain contexts from either the time we live in or the place we are or the opportunities that we're given. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, has some shape on the kind of music we end up writing. Uh, of course, Carson, when I say that you're very prolific and you don't have problems with coming up with ideas, um, it's, it's, it's just one side of the of the coin right uh, but uh, it's it always comes down to the present moment right what do you do with this blank page right today mm -hmm. or tomorrow or the next morning um, so do you have a specific advice for people who feel kind of a little bit stuck uh, and see, uh, looking at this blank page or blank computer screen if they working from with software um, how they could get themselves unstuck? Yeah, I mean, I as I as I was sort of was saying earlier, for me the process involves so I, I, I to me the blank page is not something I confront in a certain way because I've tried to spend enough time in my head before that so that I know what to put down. It's not it's not sort of that I sit down and look at the blank page and say what am I going to put on this page? Yeah. I already know in my head what that's going to be, and so. I, you know, I think it's it's different for different people, but I, I, you know, I would, I encourage people to spend time thinking about, to really think about what the piece would be, um, what its shape is, what its, um, you know, what it's, what the trajectory of it is, even aside from the actual pitch content or rhythms or musical material, because I think that's, that's a lot of it. You sort of have to have a reason, an idea for doing the piece that you're mm -hmm. doing, whatever, whatever that is. Um, 
and I try and I try and do as much of that preparatory work as possible in the months before. So that the idea is that when you sit down to actually write out the music, it's not this process of trying to think of everything then. Um, certainly for some people, um, improvisation is a is a tool that leads them to composition. For me, it's not so much the case, but it's um, for a lot of people that is a part of their process. Um, so certainly that can that can sometimes jumpstart ideas for people just sitting down at their instrument whatever that is and um just sort of fooling or not even trying to improvise the piece but uh just sort of coming up with some ideas and material and maybe some random little thing you did in that improvisation is like oh that could be the the seed for the piece uh -huh. um that were that's that's how a lot of, that's not how i compose but that that is how many people that is how many people compose and it seems to work well for them that's right, uh, Carson. I just remember that uh, this morning, for example, uh, I went to the church and I sat down on the organ bench and I put uh, opened the Gregorian chant book and uh, looked at the theme for today of the of the chant and I played. I improvised, you know, a piece and uh, um, a number of times I have transcribed my own, uh, you know, improvisations mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes it's better than others uh, because uh, when you improvise, you don't have uh, time to think. You have to react and create in yeah. the moment. Uh, that's different when you create um, on the table, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Writing or thinking and you can erase, delete, uh, uh, rearrange things, mm -hmm. uh, transpose things um, in various shapes waves and um, but but sometimes this improvisation is kind of spontaneous and this free free mm -hmm. creativity uh, is compelling as well yeah and i i think particularly for people that are thinking that improvisation may lead to composition the other thing is not to always is that not to always think that the whole improvisation needs to be something that you're yeah. going to transcribe this. Mm -hmm. It's not that you're going to sit down, you're going to improvise a piece beginning to end, and then you're going to write that piece down. It might be that you improvise and you decide, you know, 90% of what you improvised, whatever, like it was fine, it was fine for, for the service, it was fine for practice, but like that doesn't need to be kept. Mm -hmm. But maybe among that, maybe you did one sort of interesting little thing in the middle, and then it's sort of like, huh, that that could be, I could develop that further, or that could be the seed of something in a piece. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it, it's just using it as a, necessarily as a way to generate material, not necessarily saying, I need to improvise the piece, and then I'm going to transcribe the piece. I think that's where some people get hung up in that idea, rather than just sort of using it as a way to just sort of fool around with musical ideas. And then maybe some of those ideas will benefit from the sort of slower careful process of composition and editing which is not something that's possible in improvisation where you're working in the moment mm -hmm. actually carson it reminds me of the comedian jerry seinfeld and his stand-up comedy uh, he says that uh, uh, in his routine he writes every day you know jokes mm -hmm. and he performs mm -hmm. those jokes and especially in the past when he was um, uh, doing stand-up comedy in various clubs, you know, and he mm -hmm. would test his ideas. He would test uh, which kind of jokes uh, would get laughs, you know, and he mm -hmm. would uh, recycle those materials and uh, rearrange them in various ways. And uh, in uh, in his act, uh, for example, of uh, let's say 20 minutes uh, act, uh, he would find maybe three two minutes of of jokes that are worth preserving mm -hmm. for the future uh, mm -hmm. you know i kind of yes. feel that it's it's the same with improvisation sometimes right you mm -hmm. play, mm -hmm. you play 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 create create and not all of the playing is is um, is on the level that you want to develop in the future right but right. sometimes this uh, clicks sticks and you recycle this material uh, for the later uh, compositions for example absolutely yep yep uh, we've been talking about your your compositions do you have uh, do you have your favorite piece i know it's a very difficult uh, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, strategically a very inconvenient uh, uh, question because you have created so many pieces right and to select just one or two or three would be very very difficult 
Yes, it, it, it is. It is very hard. It's hard. And you also, you know, I, I remember a colleague saying that his favorite piece, a composer colleague saying his favorite piece was whatever piece he had just finished writing, you know, uh -huh. because you're so you're, you're, that's sort of when you're, I think, much, much of the time very, you know, you, you sort of, you're enthusiastic, you've finished it, you've sent it off. Um, um, it is, it, it, it is very hard. I, I also historically, there's a trend for composers to be, to have, to be particularly fond of pieces in their own output that other people don't like so much or that aren't as popular. You know, it's sort of like sticking up for the, the, you know, your, your creation that's not as, not as, not as well liked by everybody else. Um, that's, that's been true throughout history. Um, mm -hmm. I think in, I, in my case, I, I don't, I have from time to time been asked to like make lists of a few, like certain pieces that I recommend to people, but I, it, it's sort of been different every time um, in one sense. And it also, because I have pieces in many different genres and they're very different expressively, it's sort of hard, it's hard necessarily to say, um, to say that. So I don't necessarily have an easy answer as to, as to that question. I, I'd probably have to think about it some more and see what I, what I, you know, what I feel like on any given day. Um, and I think also you don't want to, most composers, you don't want to spend too much time living in your past pieces because that you know you want to be aware of what you've done before but you also have to keep your mind somewhat clear um to go forward um because you don't want to keep writing the same piece over and over again there are certainly composers that do that some some producing very interesting music but they're basically writing the same piece over and over again um mm -hmm. that's never been something that really interests me and so so i i've always tried to strike this balance of being aware of what I've done before, but not, not sort of living in it so much that, that my mind can't be clear for new, new things going forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, you know, um, uh, a few months ago, uh, my friend, uh, James Flores, Australian organist, approached you uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the idea of uh, 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 publishing some of your videos, organ videos, uh, on on the Steam blockchain, Steam platform. And oh yes, yes, you remember right. that. Mm -hmm. How did you react, first of all? Oh, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, the pieces I record and share are meant to. Uh, the reason I do it is so people that can hear them. So I'm perfectly mm -hmm. happy for people to. I, I think I told them at the time. I sort of don't follow all all the things related to that. So. Um, you know, it's just a matter of limited time for me. But I, I mean, the, the reason I, the reason I record the repertoire by other composers I record is so that it can be heard by people. So I, I certainly have no objection to, to mm -hmm. people sharing, sharing the recordings. Yeah. And here, uh, James created, um, created uh, an account for you, Carson Kuman on Steam. So if you ever want to claim your account, you can, you can actually. Uh, oh, right, right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. For, you, for yourself, this, mm -hmm. this username, Carson Kuman, it's yours. But uh, I wanted to point out mm -hmm. that uh, because it was started 59 days ago, as, as mm -hmm. uh, from now, um, it, it's, uh, it has been generating uh, revenue, you know, every day, and uh, mm -hmm. so far, so far, uh, in in U.S. dollars, uh, your account is worth one dollar forty nine cents. <laughs> well, there you go, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It just you are not doing anything. You're you just uh, it's a passive <laughs> revenue stream for you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> In 100 years, you will be a steam millionaire. Yeah, yeah. No, a dollar forty-nine does not buy much in the USA, unfortunately. But <laughs> <No>. <laughs> buys even less in a country like Sweden. But <laughs> but yeah. not much in the USA either. <laughs> yeah, but this leads me to the idea of your prolific um, uh, recording uh, process, right? You you have hundreds and even thousands of recordings on YouTube. It's amazing uh, for me to look at those because you not only playing your own compositions, but you playing, uh, you know, pieces by other composers. Uh, it's it's uh, fabulous to see that uh, that an organist uh, has so much love and potential for for new 
new music, modern mm -hmm. music uh, by living composers. C could you share a little bit uh, about that idea? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, al that's always been my area of interest um, is contemporary music. And because I am an organist, that's the, that's the area I work in. So, so um, as, a, as a recitalist and performer, that's all I perform. I perform only contemporary music by living composers, mostly living, sometimes recently-ish dead composers. But, but uh, music of the, basically all music written after 1950 and much of it much more recent than that um, mm -hmm. by a whole host of composers. That, that's my area of interest. That's all I play in concert. And that's, um, that's been the focus of my recording efforts as well, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is, to, is to protect this repertoire. There's, the world is full of organists who play nothing but the standard repertoire all the time, some of whom play it extremely well. And um, I just feel that there's an absolutely no need for another recitalist doing that. And so I, I focus unapologetically and exclusively on the music that I love the most, which is um, the music of our time. Mm -hmm. And Carson, do you find that uh, this, uh, this process of uh, uh, playing and performing contemporary music feeds your creativity as well? I'm sure it does. It, it um, being, I, I love the excitement of the discovery of learning new pieces by other composers and, and certainly being just being around and seeing what people are doing and sort of constantly every day working on practicing that music and, and learning it. No question that that sort of feeds my own creativity. It's not, it's not the, it's not a case of like copying something someone's doing in any direct way, but it's sort of all, you know, it all, it all goes into your head at some level and you, you get, get sort of mixed around and, mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it has a, I'm sure it has an impact on my own, my own work. Um, Remember, uh, I was very surprised. Uh, I, I dedicated one short piece for you, um, maybe last year. Uh, mm -hmm, yes. Or to you, you know, without any expectation, you know, I, I, I did that uh, for a number of people, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whom I became friends uh, through through knowing uh, their work online, through mm -hmm. being guests on the podcast, you know, I, I have this uh, idea of sharing my own music this way too. And I sent this piece to you and uh, a few days passed and you recorded it. I was, yeah. you know. <laughs> Uh, blown away <laughs> you know <laughs> it's 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 uh, so it's it's so different uh, to hear your own music performed by other people not by yourself but by yes. others do you find yourself also um uh, maybe uh, amazed in a way when other people play your music and they play differently than you maybe imagine um, to some degree, yeah. I, I, I don't play my own music very much at all, um, really very little. I, mm -hmm. Basically never in concert, and I've recorded some of it, but not, not very much at all by, by comparison. Uh, for me, what I, what I get excited about per, as a performer is, is the sense of discovery um, in someone else's work. In my own music, I know too much about it because I wrote it. Um, so it doesn't give me that same sense of discovery. But on the other hand, I'm delighted to hear what other performers do with it. Um, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I like everything that everyone does necessarily. I some performances I like more than others, but um, I'm very opinionated about that. Um, you know, but uh, but I I when when I hear an interpretation by a, a skilled performer and who is faithful to what I've written, but but also brings their own musicality to it that's very exciting mm -hmm. i get upset when someone plays something and changes the notes or plays it at the wrong speed or do all, all those things i dislike very strongly <laughs> but um, but but when someone when someone is inhabiting the piece and being true to what i wrote but also showing their musicianship through it that that that's very special and that um i appreciate that when that happens um, i um sometimes write um, yeah. tempo indication ad libitum leaving free, yes. freedom for the composer for the performer to 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 be free and choose tempo and uh, a lot of uh, interpretational things too so that uh, i wouldn't get limited uh, with just one idea of the performance mm -hmm. um, of course of course not all of the performances are the same as you say uh, and sometimes people interpret uh, things differently 
and and uh, a certain certain at certain speed for example uh, this particular piece sounds like a different piece you know yes that's, yes that's not necessarily a bad bad thing it can, can yeah no they're, fresh, they're can, fresh. yeah they're, that can, it can be interesting at times what what bothers me is when something is when the concept of the piece is very clearly linked to something about its speed, for example, and people do that. I have I have a few pieces that are very fast and rhythmic and driving, sort of, yes. you know, a, a, like a Tarantella or a Jig or something like that. And I've heard some performances of those where they're just played extremely slowly. And that, that really disturbs me because that means the person doesn't understand what the piece is. And maybe they aren't able to play it fast, but in which case they shouldn't be playing it then or they mm -hmm. shouldn't be playing it in public yet. Because the, it, that's not a, that's not just a different interpretation. That's just in my mind. That's just wrong. They they mm -hmm. they don't understand the idea of the piece. Whereas you're right. There are other pieces that can that can exist in very different ways, and they're just sort of different versions of the same thing. But yeah. it's not that one is necessarily wrong or right. But I but I do I do feel sometimes there are ways that are wrong. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and uh, sometimes. Uh, it, performers don't have the skill right uh, as you say there's also that there's also that and that like like yeah. d minor toccata by bach or vidor toccata everyone loves to play those two pieces and we've heard uh, perhaps uh, many times <laughs> when they shouldn't play that piece right yeah yeah i mean and i i think there's i think it's also about what the context is for that playing i mean there are obviously people at many different levels of skill and seriousness uh, as players, which is fine and somebody, but it's, it's to, put your, to put a recording out or to put something out publicly in a way, particularly when it's a piece by a living composer, you're representing that person's work. And so I feel you have to meet a certain, you should at least meet a certain standard, mm -hmm. um, you know, of, of being ready to, to sort of share your work in a, in a public forum that way. Um, and so, and so things that don't meet that standard, they do, they do bother me. Mm -hmm. um, but um, partially because I would, I would try my best never to do something like that to someone else's music. You know, I wouldn't want to only learn the piece halfway and then put out a recording that's full of wrong notes and at the wrong tempo and, changing things you know that some of my pieces i've seen videos people have posted online where they just they just make changes in the music and that you know i i, I couldn't imagine doing that to someone else's work without i mean at least not without discussing it with them or having that be part of a collaboration the idea that you would just go ahead and do that and then post it online when i'm still alive even i i just it, it blows my mind but <laughs> but yet there are those videos out there of people uh -huh. playing things like my tuba tune or something and just just making it up i see i see yeah uh, sometimes you, you create something and this piece has a life of its own right you it know does, it does and i and that's why i don't seek out recordings of other people playing things if someone wants to send me something i'll listen to it but i don't go looking for them because some of the time i'm going to be upset and so i don't i don't need that mm -hmm. you know <laughs> I'm delighted that people are finding the music useful in their context, but some of the performances I don't want to have to hear if it's not going to be if it's not going to be played at least to a certain standard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wonderful. So, Carson, we have uh, approached uh, probably the ending part of our conversation. Sure. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's you know such a terrific. Uh, time for me to to meet another composer and creator in general not only uh, composer of musical things um, but a person who who cannot live uh, without uh, creating something even a day do you do you have in this itch you know that you have to create something every day no no no, no. i mean because um i i think it's because as I as I was saying, there's always some part of my mind that's working on things. So, for example, I I this I mentioned that very large oratorio that I had finished in the in August, mm -hmm. um, and I I wrote a couple little pieces in September for some things that I I need to get done. But I haven't I haven't written any piece for the last about a month and a half. I haven't I haven't written out any music mm -hmm. um, for for a whole month and a half. Coming but off of that you thing. are thinking but, about it. But I, uh, I know that I know all the next things I need to do. So absolutely, in my mind, I am thinking mm -hmm. about what those are going to be, even though I haven't put a single note on paper or in the computer for for mm -hmm. over a month. 
Yeah. Um, so it's not, it's not necessarily that it's like every day I must, I sit down at the desk and I must put dots on the page or I must put, put, uh, you know, notes into the computer. It's not, it's not that kind of process, but it, you know, I couldn't, I can't turn my brain off. So it's, so, so there is some part of every day, sure. That's spent spent thinking about creating music. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, um, Carson, um, where could people find you and your work online? It's, it would be wonderful for them to visit your website, probably, and YouTube channel, and even more something, right? Yeah, yeah. I, certainly all my compositions are cataloged on my website uh, with links to all the, there are many, many CD recordings of them, many recordings online, many publications, physical publications of the scores. All of that's organ, very or much organized and archived there. It's a lot of pieces. Um, so I've tried to keep it all as organized as possible. And yes, you said I have a, I do have a YouTube channel, uh, which is also linked to there, which is almost entirely me, me performing pieces by other composers. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wonderful. So let's spell out your website for other people. Yes. Yes. My name, Carson Kuman, C-A-R-S-O-N-C-O-O-M-A-N.com. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the portal to everything. Everything else links from there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So before we finish this conversation, Carson, I just want to ask the last question. What are you currently working on and or, or thinking about creating? Yes. Um, I have uh, I have two two things. I have a short piece for Christmas that I need to write very soon for the choirs here at Harvard University where I work. I usually write something for Christmas every year for our big, our big Christmas services with the choirs. Mm -hmm. um, and I need to do that. Um, and then the next significant piece I need to write is a, an orchestra symphony for a, uh, an orchestra in the state of Florida. Um, so that, that, will, that will take my next number of months. I need to start that soon. Um, they'll perform it in the summer. So I need to work on that throughout the whole spring. It'll be my fifth, my fifth symphony. Wonderful. Um... Have fun creating, have fun thinking about your next project. Thank you. And uh, uh, we'll hope that uh, our listeners from 89 countries will flock to your website, <laughs> carsonkuman.com, and to your YouTube channel and get to know you and your compositions and your performances and say hello to you, right? Thank Absolutely, you. Absolutely, sure. Thank you, so much. Thank you for having me. Yes, wonderful. Um, uh, you have a terrific day and uh, I hope to meet you again. Of course, absolutely. This blog is supported by Total Organist, the most comprehensive organ training program online, where you will find courses for every area of organ playing, including technique, practice, sight reading, repertoire playing, hymn playing, improvisation, composition, music theory and harmony, with hundreds of scores and thousands of exercises. Here is what some of the students are saying. Hugh writes, the sight reading course has helped me tremendously. Thank you very much for your SS courses and all your help. Robert writes, I found the fingerings, registration ideas and general comments to be excellent. John writes, I have found your download very helpful. It was really excellent. I have watched some of your teaching videos and when I read your instructions. I try to imagine you are there teaching me. You may feel disappointed that I am two three days behind, but I am a slow learner and I have committed to taking the time to get it right as you say. But the other night my wife commented that she had never heard me play such a detailed melody in the left hand so well. My left hand is generally poor. Robert writes, It has been a great pleasure in my life of having discovered your courses and material as well as the YouTube work of recordings. You have a calm and pleasant way of teaching. Ron writes, Hi Vida Santosha, thank you guys. What a wonderful response to my email note to you. You've got me right, and I feel you understand my level of playing. Yes, at home and lucky that I have an organ for that reason. I am paying attention to this, and I am going to try this haha no longer secret model. Yes, and I love Caesar Frank too. What is very nice about your blog podcast is that Osha and Vidas are like a Socratic dialogue. 
and by bouncing things off of each other, so much more information comes out and is expressed. Your comments contain a wealth of information and understanding. I really appreciate this. It is very inspiring and will keep us moving forward. Would you like to receive the same or even better results that our students are getting? If so, join them at organduo.lt slash total dash organist. And of course, you will get the first month free too. You can cancel anytime. Also, if you haven't yet subscribed to receive free updates of this blog, make sure you do that at organduo.lt. By subscribing, you will also receive free video, how to master any organ composition and 10-day organ playing mini course. This was Vidas and Osha from Secrets of Organ Playing. And remember, when you practice, miracles happen.